South Florida Hospital News Hospital News and Healthcare Report. Let me click that. Um, so anyway, let's get started. I am going to stop my video so that I don't have to um, be distracted. But anyway, here we go. So yes, we're going to talk today about some of the pitfalls in medical practice management. I always put uh, terms and conditions. We know that Charles is recording this webinar and he will be posting it for everyone. And I'll also be posting it to our YouTube channel. So I guess if you can't sleep at night and you really wanna hear this again, you can. A um, Little bit about us, we're in our 23rd year, Coleman Consulting Group, and um, we have a lot of experience in practice management and uh, healthcare in general. So that's a little bit about us. And my business partner, Wilma Torres, is attending and she'll probably chime in from time to time as well. So our agenda for today is to talk about five issues. And we believe that these are top issues that we've seen, and I will tell you in the last few years, among our largest medical practice clients and medical groups, I will tell you that we see these represented in about 80 to 90% of those clients. So, um, you know, we thought it's not everything. We're not going to touch on a lot of very uh, sexy topics like compliance, which we touched on last time, but we will again in the future. But, and I saw some compliance professionals among the audience, but we are going to talk in general terms and perhaps these things will apply to you. Perhaps they won't, or you'll know, or you're thinking about these issues. So the list really can be endless. We're going to talk mostly in generalities. Of course, there are always exceptions. And if we discuss a topic and you feel like it really doesn't apply to you as a physician, yay. But we have seen this uh, occurring more and more among our medical practice clients, and those are the reasons why we selected these top five. So if you relate to some of these and you think, wow, um, we're really committing some of these pitfalls or we're in the middle of a pitfall, don't worry. We'll give you some suggestions on uh, things that you can do. So with that, let's talk about pitfall number one. And this one, believe it or not, occurs a lot. And it's the cast of family. Now, we understand the reason why many providers have family members employed in their practices. And especially when, when we work with providers just establishing their practice, family seems to be the most logical group of people because, of course, they have your back. Uh, you probably can get them to volunteer their time or pay them very little. And when you're getting a new practice off the ground, you really need to conserve dollars. And they're a wonderful group of people who love you and want to see you succeed. They're excited about this new venture. But there can be drawbacks. And one being that generally they're not experienced in healthcare administration or even practice management. So some, some might feel like, well, you know, it's kind of a no brainer. How hard is it to manage a practice? Uh, I will tell you from being in the trenches for 30 plus, I have, to, I have to like stutter on that, 30 plus years, there's a lot to it. And there are different levels of management and we're gonna talk about that. So getting through the day to day, maybe a little easier. The overall aspect of practice management really does require, has a lot of moving parts. The other thing is that it can be quite destabilizing to a practice when you have family members and non-family members. So unless you have a very small practice and everybody is family, which would be interesting because you'd like never get away from them, right? But when you have two classes of workers, it is truly destabilizing and we've never seen it work. There are many morale issues. There are individuals who are viewed perhaps with suspicion. There can be power struggles. There are obviously a lot of the disciplinary issues that you deal with just as part of being a manager get a little kind of unclear when you're dealing with family members. 
who perhaps have issues like they're not getting through the work or they're not doing, they're not very dedicated or they're not getting through the tasks that are assigned or doing them to a certain standard or they're not showing up on time or they take long lunches or whatever the issue is. So you create two categories of people and the resentments can run very deep. And the last thing that a practice wants is the morale issues that come from, you know, well, their family, they can get away with anything or they don't have to do their work or I have to do double the work because I've got to do somebody else's tasks that they're not finishing or not doing right. And you don't have anybody to complain to. So just something to think about. And eventually it can increase your costs because they start out, you know, wanting to help, but life happens, right? And the more that your practice grows, you may find that you are adapting jobs to the person as opposed to selecting the person that can do the complete job, which means that then you fracture your tasks and end up needing additional staff to get through the workday. So that said, um, oh, and my last one, of course, is the Hotel California effect. So if you remember that song, at the end, it says you can check out any time you like, but you can never leave. Sometimes family members don't go away, or you don't know how to move them on. I don't have a man magic wand. Well, I do have a magic wand, but it doesn't work for this. So a couple things that I would suggest to you, and we're always going to tell you what what you can do about this. Shift your mindset. I think starting out with that, um, we're big on, and perhaps it's our stage of life, you know, middle age, you start thinking about, okay, what, what do I want my practice to look like? What do I want my business to look like? What is the next chapter? What am I working toward? So it's thinking about what are you moving toward? Are you moving toward wanting to sell your practice eventually or scale back? Um, and then shift your mindset about how you're going to run it. Uh, performance standards, having practice standards that can be implemented that everyone needs to adhere to can help because then you're holding everyone to a specific standard. Reinforcing the chain of command, and hopefully there is one, um, which means that whoever is the person that, that you as the provider have designated to be the, the managing person of that practice, use them, right? Let everything go through that person and let that person deal with the performance issues, which means a little bit of tough love on the part of the provider family member who then really should step back and not um, tinker with it, not be an, um, an avenue where family members can come and say, oh, you know, I'm being asked to do this, or I don't agree with that, or I'm not doing this, or whatever it is, or I don't like her, or she was nasty to me, whatever the issue is, that's not your world as a provider, because you're dealing with life and death, and your patients and insurance companies, right? So that's not for you. And talking through it now, I'm going to tell you the other side of my brain says these are all band-aids. I've never seen it. Wilma and I have been doing this for a very, very long time. And even before we formed the company, we were practice managers and administrators. And we've never seen a practice staffed with family members and non-family members to be successful in the long run. So I think that it's something that you may want to talk to somebody about. You may want to talk to those family members and perhaps make some tough decisions, but understand what the effects can be, right? Now, I wanted to talk really quickly about management styles, and these are gender neutral, but I could not find gender neutral um, or, or uh, clip arts representing both genders, so I'm not picking on men here, and I would have loved to find somebody with a lab coat but first is the control freak type A. This, I'm raising my hand, you cannot see me. I am a type A control freak. I've mellowed with age, but probably my um, brain is wired to wanting to keep all of the plates spinning, 
and, you know, juggling chainsaws and that sort of thing. Other providers are, you know, bury their heads in the sand. And I have those days too, and months, right? Where things are going, things are happening, things are, are working. Don't bring me the problems. Just let me keep doing, keep me in my groove. Let me keep doing my thing. And unless something's exploding or on fire, take care of it or ignore it. And then the third one, you know, there's the management style that is conducive to a high performing team. This is, it's not utopia. I mean, it, it's possible to have a team of individuals where everyone has a defined role with mutual respect and everyone has areas of accountability. But these teams are, they're made. They don't just happen. So keep in mind, if you relate to one of these styles, and many of, you know, I'm choosing my words very carefully here, right? Um, many providers that we've worked with over the years, good grief, I can't even count them, have control freak tendencies. Why? Because, you know, you're training and what you are meant to do is pretty much take control of a situation and help a patient. But when it comes to building a practice and building the culture of a practice, being aware of these styles is important. So moving on to pitfall number two, I want to talk about managers with a capital M versus managers with a little m. And there is a difference. Doctors are not managers. And that's okay. Because managers are not doctors. And so when we look at the area of practice management and perhaps your business in particular, there are obviously responsibilities. The buck stops with the physician owner of a practice and we get that. But managers with a capital M can take a lot of that heat and orient the operations of the practice to meet your goals as the owner. But having those defined is important. Inherent in this whole thing is also the training, right? Because physicians are trained to a great degree more reactionary, right? Something happens, you need to step in, take control, stabilize the situation, be de decisive, and be quick about it. Whereas in management, sometimes quick is not good because there's a certain amount of reflection, study, trial and error, tweaking that happens just in the role of management. So there's that issue. Next is that managers with a capital M have specific training. And I'm not necessarily speaking about college education in health services administration, although, you know, I'm a big fan. Uh, but there are technical programs that and continuing education that assist individuals in learning and growing as managers. The issue being that managers with a capital X, with a capital M, can flex down the chain of work, right? You can have a, a manager, well-trained manager, who can answer a phone and write a referral. But the other way doesn't usually happen. Managers with a little M usually cannot flex up the chain of work and take on those additional skills that are higher level skills. Managers capital of them have a scope of authority that is appropriate to their role. And this is predetermined and agreed upon with the physician owner. Small M managers do not. They usually work as couriers of information, messengers to and from the doctor. So who's really running the practice is the physician, but there's a manager middle person kind of doing the bidding and going back and forth, handling low level things. And that can bring issues. Capital M managers command respect beyond the title. Little M managers don't because everybody knows they're not really in control. And so Consider whether your practice has a capital M manager or a little M manager. And 
how that's working for you. In most practices that are looking to grow, that are dealing with all of the things that we deal with in today's healthcare environment, we believe that you need more capital M managers. Now, can they be groomed? Sure they can. But it's, it really is very difficult to groom someone from the inside. I mean, we've seen managers who are excellent. And remember, I'm talking generalities. I know for a fact, and I have met amazingly talented individuals who have on the job training and that's it. And they were, you know, um, receptionists or medical assistants and they have worked their way up, but that's not the usual person. And I've seen highly educated managers, capital M, maybe all the letters are capital, with more letters behind their names that have absolutely no common sense and all they know is book knowledge and they don't know how it works in the real world. So again, these are generalities, but consider whether your practice has a little M manager and needs a capital M manager. And I will tell you that our experience is that these can be groomed, but you're not likely to be successful doing that for several reasons. It's hard when you know that Sally was the front desk girl and now she's the one trying to tell you things about your practice. Many providers, many people, many superiors don't necessarily see that person in that new role. They're also managing the people that they were having lunch with. So the employees, you know, and going out to happy hour, the employees may not see that person as manager, capital M role. So consider whether you do need to assess that situation, maybe make a change, bring in a manager that is a capital M manager. If that is where your practice is headed and those are the goals that you have for your practice. So you really need to, I would say, soul search, consider your management style. Can you let go, have a meeting of the minds and have a manager who is an autonomous partner as opposed to an extension of the practice owner. This is a continuum. The person may be working in a different, you know, at any, any point along this uh, continuum of autonomous partner. But I think like parents, and I don't know, this was just the thought, so go with me. You know, mom and dad raising kids need to be on the same page. So providers and managers have to be on the same page, understanding what is acceptable, what is the standard of excellence that you want to achieve in your practice, what are your goals, where are you moving toward, and they've got to be in sync. And the same way that, you know, mom doesn't usually say, yes, you can go to the party without talking to dad because maybe dad already said no, you've got to be on the same page and working together in the same direction. So something just to think about there. So what to do, I think I already covered what to do. I, I suggested that you evaluate the manager that you have. And, you know, experience, and, and Wilma and I were, were discussing this today, uh, talking about some of the projects that we've had in the last few years, where we've had very strong providers with little M managers. And in one case, we were asked to do a practice assessment specifically to evaluate that manager. And the manager was not manager material. And we told a provider, she is still there to this day. And I'm telling you, this was a very, very long time ago. So sometimes based on the provider's personality, we see that certain managers are the ones that are selected because the dynamic is the dynamic that the provider wants. So if you want to be more in charge of your practice and you want to be calling all the shots, truly, truly, we had another client who the provider, I kid you not, the doctor wanted to be consulted on what trash bags were bought for the practice. I am not making this up. Wilma, you remember. So, you know, it just depends on, on where you want to go and how you want to get there. Pitfall number three, more isn't always better. So we know that health services management is complicated. There are a lot of moving parts and there's a lot of theory behind it. And there's management little M and management big M. 
So you're talking about first operational management, getting through the day, as opposed to growing your practice, tweaking key performance indicators, and achieving a certain level of financial excellence that is not for the little M manager to accomplish for you. The three areas where we see the more being looked at are primarily staff, technology, and money. So these are the areas where we see a lot of, you know, something's not working, let's throw more staff into the mix. Oh, wait a minute, let's get the newest newfangled, the best ACE technology, or let's just spend more money to make something better. So let's talk about staff for a second. And I know I'm going to put these up and, and I'll talk about them um, in a different um, in different order, but more staff doesn't necessarily make for better issues or better operations. More staff often bring more issues to the practice. And too many hands result in a great deal of inefficiency. So from our standpoint, when we've gone in to look at a practice, you know, it starts out with what what is everyone doing? What are the tasks that they are doing? And analyzing them and analyzing the individuals and how they do it. So that's how you know if you need more staff. But most of the time, the way it happens is somebody's complaining, work is falling behind, and, oh, we need more people. Sure, go ahead and hire more people without really looking at what work what work is being done? How is it being done? And analyzing, do we really need, what are people spending their time on? And do we really need more people in the mix? The larger your staff, obviously, the uniformity of process, perhaps that you have established, gets diluted because they require more supervision, a lot more of them, less management, and people start making changes or they don't follow a particular process that you've established because they think, you know, where I did, where I worked before, they did it this way. And, or sometimes your practice may not have that infrastructure and that uniformity established by your organization. And so people bring in their own flavor of where they've been. Um, and I did speak about adapting the job to the person. And I will tell you, you know, in 23 years uh, running a consulting firm, we've done it. We've done it, and I'm sad to say, but we can recognize it, right? Because we know the tasks and the uh, key essential functions that each position should be able to accommodate. And sometimes because there are training gaps or knowledge gaps or interest gaps, we start molding the job to the person as opposed to having the person complete all of the functions that are required of that position. That means it's going to cost you more in hiring more people. So job analysis looks at a few things. Number one, are you being realistic in what you're expecting one person to do? And also looking at the knowledge and the effort expended by the individual. Have you matched the right person to the, to the right job? Something to think about. The second one is technology. And wow, there's a lot of technology in healthcare. And we've seen over these 23 years, it's not always the answer. I cannot tell you how many times we have seen companies switch EMRs or create applications or other types of uh, technological things in their practice that are supposed to make things better and they don't. And the biggest one there is training deficits. When you implement new technology, it is extremely time intensive and time is money. So many times you need to lighten schedules, and take the time, take people offline so that you can um, set things up correctly, educate your staff, make sure that they understand. And we see practices by and large not using all of their technology to capacity. So the whole idea of, wow, this is going to save us all time and eventually money ends up not being the case. 
And I could tell you of one group that had killer HEDA scores. These people, I am telling you, were at the top consistently. And they had one of the most powerful EMRs on the market today that has HEDIS integration. But do you know what they used? I still, to this day, I don't understand how they did it, but they did it. They used post-it notes. I'm not kidding. They had binder clips of post-it notes. And that is how they made sure that they met all of the measures. And it required stopping that somebody to understand and show them and adapt their powerful EMR to show them that there was a module that could do this for them, but nobody had the time because everybody's always so busy. So, okay, keep using your system because we really need to be five stars. So we understand, but when you're paying for things and you implement certain technology, which is not inexpensive, it's, it costs you more in double work. So looking at that before you spend the money and then making sure that you implement it correctly, giving people the correct education, you know, training and education in medical practice is sometimes not very formal. Um, many times, you know, we hire somebody, we're, we're hurting, they've got a pulse, they've worked somewhere else, and we throw them in, give them the basics, and expect them to succeed. And so... Bringing, spending additional money on staff technology, a lot of times you can start with training and get everybody back onto the same page. Money doesn't solve everything. Of course, I would like to experience that firsthand, right? Give me unlimited money and I'll let you know if it doesn't solve any, everything, but it doesn't. Many times it's a pacifier. And I guess an example of this one is, you know, evaluating your benefits and your wages to make sure that they really are competitive and that they allow you to recruit the people that you want, the hopefully the stars that are going to help you get your practice where you want it to go. We all know of the individual who was central to the medical practice. This person, super talented, uh, been with us a long time, gets offered a job somewhere else and is leaving supposedly for more money. And then comes the counter offer. Frankly, I'm going to tell you, I'm insulted by the whole counter offer thing. Because if I was the employee, I'd be thinking, well, wait a minute. And a lot of them do, and some of them voice it. I'm the same person I was last week. If I'm so valuable, why did it take me to leave to threaten you for you to pay me now what you think I'm worth? Why didn't you pay it to me when I was worth it last week or two weeks ago? So in some, in some respects, it's a little bit of a pacifier because when people, when people leave, they leave for a lot of reasons and money isn't always the only one the only reason. Um, there could be issues with culture, with the, way that the or with the way the organization runs, with the family members, and the money is tempting, and it's great, and it solves my problem right now, but guess what? In a month or two, once the individual has incorporated that new salary or new wage into their spending patterns, the problems, the issues are still there. So, Yes, money's important, and money's important to everyone. But instead of the reactionary counteroffer, perhaps take a, an objective look at the practice and look at issues of culture, which begin with management. They begin at the top. How people are treated, how the work is divided, who's doing what, how are mistakes handled, all of those things, and how is the money? And it's really a methodical thing. And most administrators would tell you, you look at pay scales, you look at job analysis, and you evaluate objectively where your practice falls on that. So, see, I get ahead of myself every time. What to do? What to do? Evaluate. 
And if you don't have the team to evaluate, then look external to your practice for individuals who can come and evaluate the, your pain points, if you will, or look at your staffing to see if it's appropriate and your use of technology, those types of things. All right, pitfall number four. I couldn't decide on the title to this one because it's really a combination of two things. Trust but verify and don't take your eye off the ball. So they're really two halves of a whole. So for all our providers and even practice managers out there, I'll ask you, do you know the revenue that comes into your practice every month? Do you know the trend in that revenue? Where are you January 2024 versus January 2023, quarter to quarter? What's your AR, account receivable? How much of your AR is over 90 days? What, how much do you have in credit balances? on the books? Have you compared the revenue per payer? Do you know who your highest paying payers are? Do you know if everything that you do in your practice gets billed? Do you know if any claims get rejected and those appeals are processed? I think I just gave you all a headache because I get a headache just thinking of these, right? And the issue is you might know because you had a meeting with somebody one day, but do you know all the time? And here's what we've found after many, many years. It's not until the crisis happens and the blood is flowing that somebody takes, pays attention because you've got a billing company, because you've got billers in the office, because you have a manager, because the money's coming in and you're busy. You're a practice owner and you've got a lot of things on your mind and the money's coming in. So, you know, I don't know if it's just the money that it should be. So what to do with this is interesting because, hang on, where's my what to do? This is something that you need to do on a regular basis. And I'm going to say, listen, we've been through four things. I don't care. Have your whole family there. Spend all, put all the staff that you want. This one is the critical one. Because if you're not paying attention, if you go on autopilot, it will take a crisis. And crises are a lot harder to get through and get back from. So on a regular basis, monthly is ideal. Request reports from your biller. Every billing system has the ability to run reports. And there are standard reports that you can request that will tell you all of these things. And you look at them. Now, if your mind goes numb, just thinking of doing this, maybe your manager is more apt to do this. Maybe the two of you together, like the partners that you should be, should be looking at this to see what are the trends. Because we've seen, we've done assessments where things have gotten buried and appeals didn't get processed and certain things didn't get billed or didn't get billed correctly. So think about what you want to know. Don't think in terms of tackling everything in one shot, but start with, let's say, the top three that you want. You want to know your revenue, you want to know your AR, and start tracking that. Look at it month to month and pay attention to the things that are, that are sitting there and aging and what's going on with them. And where are you relative to another period of time? Because we know that everybody is working hard and the idea is to work smarter but not harder. Are you taking advantage of being able to bill all of the things that you can to bring revenue into your practice? So start 
Start with what you want to know. Make it a small, manageable list that you can add to as you go and establish a schedule and put it in your calendar and make time for it. Not if you remember, not, you know, if it's not a, a, a hard day, but it's got to be a regular thing that you do. Because remember, and the compliance people that are on this um, webinar, if they are here, will tell you the liability is all yours. So, you know, not only do you need to make sure that things are being billed correctly, but that you're maximizing your time and the revenue that's due to you and your providers for your practice. So I will leave you with that one and move on to pitfall number five, sometimes trying to do it all. Outsourcing some things might make sense. This is not, again, not a one size fits all thing, but in some cases, um, allowing others to help you will be beneficial and help to stabilize your operation. Initially, it may seem a little bit more expensive, but usually the way it works out, it's, it's, it's more expensive in the long run. So there are a couple of areas where this is important. So first can be, you know, things like setting up your system so that you can run meaningful reports, um, billing, coding and billing, managing your accounts receivable. Some practices have internal people who do that. Others farm it out. But whichever way you go, credentials do matter. And because providers are essentially on the hook for everything that happens in their practice, even if you have a biller, incorrect billing affects you. Credentials matter and expertise takes time and effort, not only to develop it, but to maintain it. So if you have individuals in your practice who are responsible for these aspects of your finances, make sure that they are as expert as they can be. And if not, then consider outsourcing those functions to people who are going to have that expertise. And again, every vendor is not the same. So we're not implying that by any means. How somebody does the job is important. And, you know, over time, we've seen, we do a lot of audit work, financially, uh, coding wise, and we'll see errors and issues that happen in practices in their billing that are because the biller knew, but the biller's point of view wasn't considered or the employee did not feel that he or she could challenge the provider. And maybe challenge is not the right word. Question, point it out, whatever. So how somebody does the job is important. Just because they're an employee doesn't mean that they're always going to go along with what you documented, what you coded, how you um, did something or how so that that gets billed a certain way. But most of the time, employees are not going to rock the boat. Sometimes vendors are not going to rock the boat. Sometimes they're not getting all of the information that they need in order to be able to safeguard your dollars because they're billing the CPT code that you selected. They're not reviewing the note to make sure that that is the right code that should have been billed for that visit. So whether you're keeping something in-house or you're outsourcing, paying attention to how the job is done is important. But outsourcing makes sense in some cases because you can design with the vendor the ideal process and the performance objectives. And that's where a contract is handy because you can establish those in the contract. So where people in your office may, you know, Sally's on maternity leave. So, you know, we're a little bit behind on billing. We're like two months behind. Well, you can establish that in a contract. And most of the time you don't know that they're two months behind, right? You stumble on that information, but with a vendor, you'll know because you're looking at those reports. Well, you'll look at those reports no matter what, but you'll be looking at those reports and you can hold them contractually accountable for the turnaround time 
in whatever process they're handling for you. And vendors are accustomed to being accountable. Everybody uses a billing company. Well, let me back up, not everybody. Most billing companies give reports. Some billing companies wait for the provider to ask for the reports, but they really should be providing you. That's like a no brainer. If you are using an outsourced billing company and you're not getting those reports on a regular basis and they're not going over them with you, then they should be because they're the experts and they can tell you where things are not making sense or where they believe that you're leaving money behind. So trying to do it all, trying to keep it all in house may not be the best move for your practice, but Remember the pitfalls, right? Trust but verify no matter who's doing it for you. Spot check. Have your manager spot check. Have an external person spot check. And then don't take your eye off the ball. Just because the money's rolling in doesn't mean that it's the right money and it's all the money that it should be. So with that, that's us. And that'll be on the PowerPoint. And we have some time for questions and answers, Charles. Did I put everybody to sleep? I think I did. Nope. I just had to find just had to find the right button. Had to find the right button. Dude, to I, thought, up again. I thought I heard snoring. Is what I thought. No, no, no. So I, I, in listening to it, I mean, there are some pitfalls, especially family, because interesting enough, in in a lot of businesses, I guess besides healthcare, family is really part of the fiber. Right. of the business. My business, for instance, the family is Carol and myself, right. is, the, is the fiber of the business. So why, in your opinion, in healthcare, it's not, and I guess, is it just because the spouse or the cousin or the daughter or the son or daughter-in-law or son-in-law may not have the background in order to do it? If they had the background, would that be different than when it relates to family? You know, all right, let's take let's take the background situation first, right? Healthcare is a different animal than most businesses. Um, without boring you with the the specifics, you know, the most businesses have a product or a service and they sell it to their customer. And the customer and the the buyer and the seller come to an agreement. Healthcare is weird because there's a third party involved. And that third party is very, very big right. because the customer is not the one paying for the services. So it adds complexity to the whole healthcare landscape to begin with. So understanding and knowing how that works, not just the small operational aspect of how do I issue a referral, but all of the things that happen around that take time and knowledge. Can non-family members do it? Sure. But practices by and large grow. Providers bring in more providers. Like I said, if they're all family, that's great because everybody's pulling in the same direction. But there are a lot of different positions in a medical practice. And so my niece is going to come and she's going to be doing, you know, handling the faxes and she's going to be, you know, helping with some prescription refills. And it's the bringing in those reactionary things. If somebody needs a job, let me give them a job and I'll hopefully train them and they will eventually become um, uh, a fully knowledgeable functioning member of the practice. Those don't always work out well. And the resentment factor that we've seen in Every single practice, Charles, where you've got both sets of people is huge, and it yeah. takes away from being productive. Well, I mean, I, I, can, I, can, I can see that. I mean, you have, you know, there, there is a bias, normally a good bias, but sometimes a bad bias to family members within the business, whether it be healthcare or not, that that person in the family can get away with, like you were saying, with more than a non-family type member. Uh, and you, you see that happen all the time or the non-family member that uh, that work very closely and then all of a sudden a family member comes in and that's a problem and then all of a sudden you have your good person that's working there right says you know why am I putting up with this garbage or crap and decides to leave and you just left 
just to have the key person that leave. So it is it is a balancing act to make sure that you don't alienate good employees by substituting family in. I hate to say it because I know it's controversial, but truly, I would not hire family. Yeah, no, I, I can, I can see, I can see the point. But I your business what... is different. I mean, because you've built yeah. it from the ground up, and right. your family, your dynamic is different, and it obviously works for you. We've not worked with anybody that it's worked for, but there may be some very high functioning practices out there that are staffed with a lot of family members, and God bless them. I'm glad to hear it. Mm-hmm. Well, how does it do? I mean. And again, I'm not going to belabor the point, but when you have large practices and normally you have a family member become a doctor or a nurse or something, if, 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 if both are at least one or both in healthcare, mm-hmm. one of their, one of their children is bound to become into, into healthcare. Normally right. it's, it's the case. Sure. And then all of a sudden that person and the, the they've been running the practice well, comes into the practice as another physician. And you see that happen all the time. I mean, you know, it's yep. father and son, father and daughter, you yep. know, you know, whatever it may be. It could be uh, mother and daughter, mother and son, whatever coming into practice. How does that relate to practice management when you see that coming in? There's something that's worked for years and all of a sudden, you know, some young gun will come, comes in and wants to change a whole lot of things. How do you handle that or, or advice? Well, you know, the, the issue is not family because that can happen no matter who enters the practice. There is a um, a period of acclimation that happens no matter what. And it challenges the status quo because like you said, sometimes these are people that are recently trained. And so they're coming into an established practice. This is how we do it here. But people are bringing new ideas, new ideas, maybe cutting edge ideas and th- really the only way that you can do that is to talk about it, explore it and listen to it and understand, but then study the practice and see, all right, does this person have a point? Because we don't change things just because change, you know, is needed. Well, that's not the right word. We don't change things just to change. We change things to make them better. And so in order to make them better, and avoid the reactionary thing, you need to be able to be objective and look at the situation and say, wow, you know what, that really is a good idea, or here's why we don't want to do it. So Mm. it's going to be destabilizing no matter what, but it's a good destabilizing, assuming that the provider that you're bringing in is going to be a, a, a wonderfully functioning, you know, member of the clinical team. We were looking at it more from a staff level which is where you've got the backbiting and that sort of thing. Yeah. But really in practices, I'm trying to think where there are children who become providers. Some of the long timers don't necessarily stay around right. only because, you know, it's time or they, you know, work closely with the one provider and the, the, the main doctor and he's now, or she is now retiring. And so that's an opportunity, but I don't see it having the same destabilizing effect as it does with staff. Sure. Okay. Well, what I'm going to do at this point in time, uh, I'll, two things. Sometimes I've, I've found in the past that since we're recording it and people don't like to ask questions while we're recording, what I'm going to do is I'm going to thank everybody for coming on tonight. But stay here. I'm going to end the recording and then kind of open up your questions so they stay within the group rather than being recorded and replayed. Okay, Okay. so I want to say thank you for joining us tonight, and we'll see you the next time.